God's word is the word of salvation. It is the way, the truth, and the life. It is the only way to heaven through his son, Jesus Christ. It's the only way we get there. God is serious about dealing with the sin of the church. You have your Bibles with you. We'll be in 2 Timothy chapter 3 today. As you find it, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, Paul had three overriding priorities in his life. One was to know Christ. Second was to defend Christ's truth, the scripture. And the third was to minister Christ's name. In Paul's two letters to Timothy, defending Christ's truth was a dominant theme. <clears throat> he was in prison in Rome at the time when he wrote this letter. He's on death row, waiting execution. But rather than think about his impending death, his mind was preoccupied about the gospel and how to get the good news to as many people as possible. Paul also understood that he lived in perilous times, and Timothy, who had left for in Ephesus, was facing problems with false teachers. And those false teachers were very certain and bold in their teachings. But Paul called Timothy to be different. In contrast to the false teachers and the false teachings that were going around, Timothy was to serve God faithfully and continually. Paul wanted to help Timothy understand how to identify false teachers and urge Timothy to continue to serve God. Let's pray and then we'll read scripture. Heavenly Father, we just do thank you for your word. I just pray for your guidance, your direction, and your understanding as we read your scripture this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We'll be reading the whole chapter. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, and treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burden their sins and lead astray by various passions, always learning and never being able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. Just as Janus and Jambers opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all as those, those two men. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim of life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfast, my persecutions and suffering that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Listeria, while persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all those who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof and correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely complete, equipped for all and for every good work. So I was going to break this down into two sections. The first nine verses drive how to identify false teachers. And first, false teachers can be identified by their lives. Paul's turning his attention now to Timothy with the godless characteristics of people in the last days. He wrote, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Now, they, all the Old Testament authors, they can consider themselves to be living in the last days. For example, Peter explains that in the day of Pentecost in Acts was the fulfillment of the prophet Joel, saying that, but this is what will be uttered through the prophets. Joel, in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. 
And the author of Hebrews also declared, How long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. And 1 John 2.18 says, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have re- heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it is the last hour. 1 Peter 1.20 says, For he was, for- was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you. And Paul went on in great detail to describe the kinds of difficulties that would be present in the last days, which he was already seeing in his day that would continue until the return of Jesus Christ. And the time of difficulty would be seen in the lives of the people. In verses 2 through 4, Paul describes their moral conduct. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. He gives 18 characteristics of people who are living in the last days in these two verses. These character traits have to do with the moral individual of these people. Now, they're not all present in one person, but we do see them in full grown. We don't see them in the full grown ugliness that they are, because people tend to put on masks and hide who they really are. Now, when Paul concluded this description with a statement about their religious observation. He said in verse 5 that these people are lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. It may be hard to comprehend. A people who lack moral character can also be religious at the same time. But we can see it today. You know, people make professions of faith. They attend worship services. They give money to church. And they may even serve in ministry in some roles. However, it's just the appearance of godliness. You know, when Sunday is over, they go back to living the rest of their life without any reverence for God. They talk about all they do for glory of God. And then they're drunk at parades, right? And then they are not truly what we call born again. They're not justified by faith alone in Christ, but God's grace alone. You know, and the reality is they're denying its power, and they're not denying the reality of power, but the power of God in their lives. You know, it's kind of easy for us to think when we look at the world around us that we're living in the worst era of time. And we think of the generation before us or centuries ago that things were much better than what they are. But I have a different perspective on it. You know, these characteristics that Paul's talking about, they're not prophecy for our current times. They were present in the first century church, things he was dealing with at that time. You know, these are things that he was seeing with and dealing with and trying to prepare Timothy to deal with. And we can still go back and see godless characters throughout all of humanity from the earliest days. In scripture, you look in Genesis 4, we see Cain and Abel, right? And two chapters later, in Genesis 6, verses 5 through 8, it says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was brought great on the earth, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man in the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds from the heavens, for I am sorry I have made them. But luckily for us, by the grace of God, he found Noah favor in Noah, right? And Noah gave instructions to build the ark. So God could destroy the rest of the world through the flood. And we keep looking through the Old Testament, we see the worship of Baal. And if you ever look into what Baal worship is, it's really pretty horrific. You know, generally speaking, it was sacrificing infants and doing other depraved acts, all for the sake of asking Baal to provide rain for their crops. And we see in the history, church, history of the church that Christians were persecuted in the first century under Nero. In the Middle Ages, we had crusades in response to Christians killing, or excuse me, Muslims killing Christians. And then not that long ago, in World War I, we had the Armenian Genocide, where there was systematic destruction of Christians. And these straits, they don't show up just in the lives of the godless, but they also show up in religious and false teachers as well. You know, we see in the Old Testament we had 
in 1 Samuel, we had multiple priests who were defiling the inner, temp- inner sanctum, the holy tent of holies. Eli's sons, they were laying with women in the tent of meetings. And, you know, we think of the prophet Samuel, his sons, they were, he made them judges, and they took bribes and perverted justice. And again, we move to the New Testament. We see people thinking they were more saved than others because they were baptized by Paul or because they were Jewish versus the Gentiles. We have Christians who were keeping the law, so they thought that they were more saved than others. However, Peter, Paul, James, and John, they all wrote letters addressing false teachers. And this is what Paul was particularly concerned with to warn Timothy about. And that's what we must look for as well. Secondly, secondly, our false teachers, they can be identified by their ministry. Paul wrote in verses 6 and 7 that for among them, those are those who creep in the households and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never being able to arrive at the knowledge of truth. After describing the characteristics of false teachers, Paul warned Timothy about these men who creep as warm their way into houses of weak women. Now, I don't, I don't think Paul is asserting that women were more vulnerable or susceptible to false teachings, but you think in the historical context, where did Christians meet back in the first century? They met in the homes of wealthier other Christians, right? They didn't meet in church buildings like we do today. And just because, like the rich man that Jesus met and encountered, these women, they had more concerns about their lives, about the wealth and maintaining it. So they was their main focus and they could not understand any depths. And therefore they would hold on to the treasures of their lives instead of more being focused about the gospel of Christ. And just as Janus and John were supposed Moses that Paul talked about in verse 8, Paul compared false teachers to these two. Now, if you scroll through your Bible to find out where Janus and Jambres is, you won't find it. These two men are not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. But according to Jewish history, they were two of Pharaoh's magicians pretending to become Jewish converts back in the time of Moses in the book of Exodus. And again, according to Jewish tradition, they were the two, they were the ones who instigated the worship of the golden calf. And again, according to Jewish tradition, they were killed with the rest of the idolaters in the worship of the golden calf. So Paul's reference to them may indicate that the false teachers in Ephesus were practicing deceiving signs and wonders. The point is that, according to Paul, like these two men, false teachers were corrupt in mind and disqualified regarding faith. And Jesus also warns us of men like this in Matthew 7, 15. He says, Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And again, if we look at the church as a whole, we can see it full of men like this today, that they teach false doctrines. You know, it's easy for us to recognize some of them, like faith healers or prosperity gospel, and name it, proclaim it. There are more that are more deceptive, like, Word of Faith or New Apostolic Reformation or the Emerging Church, which is just an example of a few that have embedded themselves in the church today. These are false doctrines that are leading people mistray. You know, Paul concluded in verse 9, but they will not get very far, for their folly will play to all, and that it was those two of those, as of those two men. You know, just as Janus and Jombers were exposed as false teachers, in the days of Moses. There are also false teachers in Ephesus who would be exposed as fraud. God's word is the word of salvation. It is the way, the truth, and the life. It is the only way to heaven through his son, Jesus Christ. It's the only way we get there. God is serious about dealing with the sin of the church.